All right, let's let's, uh, let's see if we've got everybody else. We this is uh, Palm Sunday, and it's taken us a while to get people to realize that Palm Sunday can be celebrated in non-traditional ways. So I thank those of you for showing up. Uh, let's see some announcements before we begin. Uh, on 2020, uh, a rather remarkable thing happened. Uh, Michelle was ordained. Now, we're still trying to figure out how that happened. Um, in my case, there was a suggestion of bribery. That's not true. <laughs> Gratuitous <laughs> gifts. Michelle was pure, pure good stuff. Bobby Vance just joined us from the Kissimmee. So she was ordained in 2020. Turns out on 2022, she was voted and officially became our, one of our affiliated community ministers and will be preaching with us nine or 10 times this year. And um, so Michelle Lowry is going to be giving words at the Agape after the uh, share. And we've got Michelle and Larry and I on board today. We got four services this month. Today, Easter Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, Michelle will be preaching. And the last Sunday in April, well, Basil will be on board. I um, want to remind everybody that Angie and Phoenix are in London. They posted pictures and we'll be posting them up in, on the weekly. They seem to be having way too much fun. I find this very, very annoying as well. Having way, way too much fun. Uh, it turns out the school term is different there than it is here. So Phoenix is not missing any school. It'll start there at the end of May, I think, and so that she's doing very, very well. For any of you that are interested, we have an opening now for secretary. It does not involve much, but we need somebody to fill that in, so let me know. Uh, Marcelli, Milani, and Jared uh, survived their first week in, in uh, Georgia. It was not as bad as they thought. Serge was up to visit them. Serge came to Miami and spent a few days in helping them get through it. And so they're, they're adjusting really, really well. I don't think any of us would, but they're doing just fine. Thank you very much. Chris Diaz joined us in. Hal and Linda joined us in from Port Orange as well. So services today, next Sunday, and the Sunday after that three in a row, and then at the end of the month, Angie and Phoenix in London, Milani, Marcelli, and Jared in, in Georgia. Uh, let me say a word to the rest of you about a word that you're going to find scary, evangelism. Florida and right now parts of this country are downright scary. There are people out there who are lonely. There are people out there who are not being affirmed. There are people who have gay kids. There are people who are gay. There are people who have trans uh, cousins and nephews. They have nowhere to go. Talk already. Welcome them here. Let them know there is a place that will welcome them. Remember, this congregation is not just in Miami. 60% of it is outside Miami. Evangelize. Tell people there is a place that they can come. They will be affirmed. By the way, all churches, when they welcome, do not affirm you. You get you inside, and then they want to change you. We want to affirm each and every person. Do some evangelism. Do some caring. Welcome people. All right. Uh, two other, three other things. Number one, this is scary. Florida is against DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know that. I got offered three classes already for the fall. My classes are all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's world religion. Yes. So I think the department is doing an end run anyway. I have a laptop for sale because the laptop I've been using is way too small. If anybody needs a very hot, good uh, Lenovo 14-inch laptop that's got a, a gaming processor, let me know. It'll give it to you for almost nothing. Okay, moving right along. Two other things. We're going to be having a Bob Dylan song this, <laughs> this Sunday. Shelter from the Storm. We will be the only congregation anywhere on Palm Sunday listening to Bob Dylan's Shelter from the Storm. That's all I'm going to say. We did Wizards in Winter for Christmas Eve. And finally, please, if you can, remember to give. We have a lot of very poor people in this congregation, and that is okay. That's good. But for those of you who can, if you can remember, we've got bills to pay. 
And uh, so far we've been doing it, but please do remember us in your thoughts, prayers, and if you can, if you can, some giving. Okay, our memorial candle before we get going. Number one, we lost over 20 people in tornadoes in Alabama, Louisiana, and um, uh, um, yeah, Alabama and Arkansas. So please remember the death and destruction in our own backyard. Hold up a candle, if you will. We want you to hold close in your thoughts and prayers for Zoraida. Remember her mother passed away. For Felix, his father passed away. And for Roy Martin, his mother-in-law passed away. Ray Rolden is recovering at home. Dave, Schneider, Dave Schroeder is recovering at home. And I know you don't know Chet, but hold Chet close to you as well. A seminary classmate from Union Theological Seminary from 1967 to 1970. And finally, we have lots of people in the congregation who've already gotten COVID in the last three weeks. So please remember COVID is out there. Please remember uh, Mark got COVID, Michelle got COVID, um, Rick and Judy got COVID. Um, Mark Freeman, who's transferred to pediatric intensive care, went for a training session and got COVID from the training session. So a lot of people have gotten COVID. Please, please remember. Okay, before we begin, one last time, let's say hello to the brave souls that showed up. Uh, Donald Grimmy got COVID too this past week. He's smiling. That shows you how sick he is. He's smiling. All right. Grimmy's smiling. Chet is with us. Mary Grimmy, who I've known since 1986. Uh, I've got pictures of, you've all seen pictures of Donald at two and a half with a giant deer hound. We've got Pam with us from from down from near Danny Sorkin and near um, um, Pat Sullivan in Forest Hills. Rick and Judy right across the way. Maureen down in farm country. Michelle and Mark from a quiet village somewhere west of Chicago. John and Christine, who I've known since 1985. Barbara Young, Bobby Vance up in Kissimmee. Pat Sullivan in in um, in Forest Hills. Chris Diaz. Are you our resident Iranian in background? Is that your background? Oh, I, I'm mute. I'm mute. I can't hear you, Chris. I'm I'm actually I'm Cuban. I'm second generation Cuban American, but I do have uh, I have had acquaintances that are uh, who are Iran and friends who are Iranian. Because I know you're uh, you're a polymath. You speak like twenty languages. Do you speak some Farsi too? I why I can have a I can hold a, a more or less of a basic conversation in in Farsi and I can under get an idea of the gist of what's uh, of roughly of what's being talked about. Now, Chris seriously has a gift. He can do this. I mean, I, he 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 he. And, I, I, and also, I do know a few words of Danish, and I know how to pronounce that infamous uh, dessert. So, which more you could probably see Maureen uh, the the virtually whooping it because uh, it's uh it's one that it's a lot easier to learn how to make than it is to pronounce and i actually made a batch last night it's all right and moving course, right along i have no idea what that was is that the language that's just never mind i'll stop, I'll yeah. stop. <laughs> yeah and, I, and i'm sure yeah and i'm sure maureen's uh, laugh, laughing laughing her backside off right now all right Okay, Serge is here from Sedona, Cecilia down the street, Cindy and Larry from Port Orange, Alan is here from, I think he's up in New York right now, uh, Danny Sorkin is in New York, Amelia Schweitzer 10 miles west of, of, um, of uh, Merritt Island, Hal and Linda from Port Orange, and Pat can care in our own backyard. Please remember to keep people in your thoughts and prayers, and we start out with something different today. Our introit is a Bach prelude. Our call to worship, I'm going to ask you to read uh, in the blue, if um, Rumi will pull it up for us. I'll ask you to read the blue. 
Today, begin, today we begin the walk to Jerusalem, the Holy Week. The demand that we face the darkness, the broken past, the abuse of power. Today we walk toward the day spring, breaking through the Easter day of joy. So let us prepare the way. Let us join together this morning in worship. To see what holiness resides within and about us, to welcome in the day and make straight the path of the work for God. And our morning prayer by those who wish, if you would read together with me for those who wish. You, the soul and heart of life itself, may we recognize your presence riding upon a simple beast of burden down the crooked streets of Jerusalem. May we not require the palms of victory and praise. The accolades and shouts of the multitude to see your glory in gentleness, patience, loving kindness, and yes, pain and sometimes death. Your way of peace, of faith, hope, and love still is our path, our joy, our way. Amen. Michelle is going to read to us kind of a bedrock of what many in this congregation stand for, if you would, Michelle. Today's first reading. Jesus knew nothing of the dogmas of the Christian creeds, the fall of man, the inheritance of sin, damnation as a punishment for sin, the incarnation, the atonement, salvation and redemption, and would not have understood their meaning or even recognized their words. It cannot be emphasized too often that Jesus was not a theologian. He interpreted religion as something not primarily to be believed, but to be lived. Michelle will read in the blue, and then I will lead us in the green. This is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 through 3. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised and we held him of no account. Our third reading today is also from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. This is verses 8 through 9. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. This is a, a, a name, I don't know if many of you know, um, I'm, um, Thinking of a comment when one of my students asked me, how old are you? And I said, have you heard of dirt? And the student said, what do you mean by that? I said, there was a time before dirt. Moving right along, some of you may not know this words, this name, Cecil B. DeMille. Does this ring? Does anybody even know who that is? Oh, you all do. Okay. All right. 
thanks to Cecil B. DeMille in the 1950s, we got this incredible explosion of biblical narratives that had no more grounding in reality than the man in the moon. But people began to accept these as reality. So what you did is you got this, this Jesus coming into Jerusalem with the entire city in uproar, millions of palms, all kinds of stuff, a plastic thing. And, you know, it, it's amazing to me when I teach Christianity, not one of the students realizes that Jesus lived nowhere near Jerusalem. That comes as a big shock. I pull up a map and I say, Jesus spent 99% of his life in the Galilee. They said, what's that? I pull up a map and they said, that's way up there. I said, yes, it's way up there between the Galilee and Jerusalem is a place called Samaria, like Samaritans. Oh, I show them a map of that. And I said, he was a peasant. Hello? Nobody knew when he was born. To this day, nobody knows when he was born. Nobody knows exactly when he died because they don't know when he was born. I said, his father was a carpenter. Mark's gospel mentions he has brothers and sisters. And we find out that therefore, since he is a peasant, nobody gives except other peasants. So don't expect when you see these Cecil B. DeMille productions and churches with banners and all kinds of stuff that a Galilean peasant is going to be welcomed in hoity-toity Jerusalem by the, by the Jerusalemites who had an attitude towards other people. Yes, you're welcome as guests during the high holy days, but let us remind you, you don't live here, that kind of attitude. So yes, I'm sure other peasants welcomed Jesus, but I'm sure that at that time when they were welcoming Jesus, nobody knew that it would ever be a last supper and nobody knew that it was going to end as it always ended under Roman occupation with death and destruction. So when we go to churches on Palm Sunday, we are actually not talking about what's really going on. What's really going on is the prequel to grief. Grief of, again, justice being denied. Grief, again, of innocence being slaughtered. I don't know if any of you are aware that there were three messiahs during the first century of the common era. Three. The difference between Jesus and the other two is Jesus' followers were not slaughtered in mass. The other two followers were slaughtered in mass by the hundreds. So what we see in Palm Sunday is kind of like denial about, well, you know, you, you mentioned, well, what about Good Friday? Isn't that a strange word, Good Friday? What is good about the crucifixion? I looked this up on the internet, and it turns out we in English are the only one who called it Good Friday. Nobody other uses it in any other language calls it good. And I remember growing up, I said, what is good about this? I asked in my church, and they said, well, you know, it's not a good day. Of course, we're, what comes is Easter is good. I said, that doesn't make sense. What you're doing is you're denying what happened today. And today was really bad. This is a time of grief. And then I noticed when I was in the ministry long, long ago, far, far away starting out, we would put all the churches together for Good Friday services. And the idea is you would have a three-hour service and there would be tremendous outpouring amongst, amongst, amongst the faithful. And with all the churches combined, interestingly enough, on Good Friday, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The attendance was always 15 or 20. Nobody wants to talk about grief. Nobody wants to mention the bad stuff. It seems to me that in this country, we have a thing about grief. It seems as if, you know, grief is, is not to be mentioned. We don't, that's, that's uncomfortable clause. Don't go mentioning Good Friday. Don't go mentioning bad things. People getting, you know, slaughtered. You know, you don't want to mention that, like in Florida, the villages that were burned down in the 1920s because of race. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about all those innocent little orphans that were dug up at that home up in North Florida by the hundreds. They try to put a stop to it. And uh, no, 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 we can't do that. We can't talk about all the three or 4,000 innocent people hanged in this. No, we don't want to talk about grief. Knock it off, Claus. No grief. What a mess we get ourselves into. 
And then we call the other word we say, it's passion. I don't know where a Christians come up with these things in the United States, calling something a Good Friday good. And then the passion of our Lord. Do any of you know where that came from? Ah, I had to look it up. Yes, I had to look it up too. It's pastior, pat, pat, patior passimus sum. It means to suffer in Latin. We don't speak Latin for heaven's sake. Why don't we just say the suffering of Jesus? Don't say the passion. I don't know. I hear passion and I think things. <laughs> and the things I'm thinking about when I hear the word passion are not what they want us to think about when they're talking about death and destruction and grief. Where do we begin about grief? Seems we don't want to talk about grief. And it seems to me Palm Sunday is a good introduction to grief. Because some bad stuff happens. And it continues to happen. Grief is important because it is a natural and normal response to loss. And that's another thing. We don't like to talk about loss. This is the country of success, sunshine, lollipops, and roses. Claws, get it. Sunshine, lollipops, and roses. Don't bring in the reality stuff. People don't go to church to hear that. They don't worry about grief. They don't worry about upset. Get your stuff together, Claus. Make people feel happy. I love Jesus and I am happy. No, that's not what you're going to get here today, folks. It's not what we're going to get. We're talking about reality today. Because grief allows us to process loss. It allows us to move on with our lives. Grief can be painful. And I don't know about you. Well, you remember growing up, people said this is a learning experience. Do you remember how nasty learning experiences were? I used to hate that. Claus, this is a learning experience. I never remember one learning experience that was pleasant. Not one. It was always when bad things happen and there was a lot of pain and a lot of loss. Don't worry, Claus, it's a learning experience. You'll get over this. You know, sometimes it takes a while to get over things. There are many different ways to grieve. And let me make this very clear, if I can. There is no right and proper way to grieve. You have to figure it out what makes sense for you. There is no right or wrong way. I'm not going to tell Mary Grimmy there's a right way or wrong way to grieve. I'm not going to tell anybody if there's a right way. You have to follow, do you, Sid Arthur, your own path and your own grief. This is not a time for judgmentalism. Which, by the way, let me remind everybody, if you're going to talk about the words of Jesus, what did Jesus say? Judge not lest you be judged. Something that ought to be engraved in, 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 in movable ink on many pulpits. Some people may find it hard to talk to others about their loss, while others may prefer to grieve privately. Some people may find it helpful to write, write about their loss. Others may prefer to do art, make music do poetry. There is no right or wrong way to grieve, and what works for one person may not work for another. Here's some things that we want to remember about grief. grief. Grief helps us to process and heal loss. And I have a list of things, by the way, we lose. Grief allows us to connect with our emotions. You know, it allows for us to connect with our emotions, and not everybody likes to connect with their emotions. Well, a lot of people do not want to connect with their emotions. Grief can help us find meaning and purpose in life. Grief can help us to grow. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And grief can help us to connect with others. I have a list here of things that we lose. I think it's rather shocking when I look at this list of how much stuff you and I lose in our lives. All of us. Everyone here has lost a loved one, however you define that. And I said to my students, if you haven't, you will. And that's not meant to be snarky. It's a, it's a fact of life. Some people that are close to you, you're not going to miss. Others, it's going to surprise you how much you do miss. Does that make sense to anybody? That sometimes you miss people and it surprises you how much you miss them. Others you thought you would, but you didn't. But there are people we lose. Some of you have experienced divorce or a breakup of a relationship. Um, I know that marriages may be made in heaven, 
Unfortunately, they have to be lived on earth. The reality is some people, it just doesn't work out. And I have never met a divorce where everybody goes away, ha, because you lose something. Even when divorces are amicable and good, you have lost time. You have lost a sense of something you thought about yourself that wasn't accurate. I remember when people used to come in, I used to do counseling when my churches were small. I remember people would come in to me and they'd want to talk about the person they divorced. And I said, we can't talk about them. I don't know them. I said, we're here to talk about you. What happened to you? What is it about you? You married the person. You went out with the person. You spent time with the person. What have you learned from this? I don't want to talk about that. Well, I said, unless you come to grips with things you know to come to grips with, then you're going to repeat it again and again and again. And everybody here has met people. I'm sure you've met people who they break up and six months to a year later, they're going out with somebody just like the person they broke up with. They even look like them. You're going, what is wrong with that? And so the reality is, you know, um, divorce and separation cause pain. There's just no getting around it. Even if it's painful for having to look at ourselves. Ooh, loss of a job. Nobody likes losing a job. I remember that I resigned from, um, from the congregation in, um, in Illinois. And I felt a total failure. Now, the resolution of that took 16 years. I'm glad to say it resolved itself well. I think at least it resolved itself 16 years later. But when you thought you've given your all and it wasn't worth anything, that's really painful. And it, was, it took me a long time to recover from that. Um, I think all of us had financial issues at one time or another, unless you have a trust. Anybody here have a trust fund? By the way, I want to talk to you about all souls. The rest of us, by the way, have worked. And I remember my mother, may her soul rest in peace, used to demand that in the summer times, I do blue collar working job, work jobs, labor jobs. Here's one for you. My very first congregation in Saugus paid me a whopping salary of $6,500. And so I dug ditches on the side and did digging for concrete forms. I did common labor. That's right. I was a common laborer. Here I was, four years of college, three years of Union Theological Seminary, why not being a common laborer? I found out how to balance things. You learn how to balance things, how to shovel things just the right way. And yeah, that was just so we could make ends meet. Everybody here has been sick. And that always causes pain and suffering emotionally as well. Ah, here's one, loss of a pet. Now, um, I have to include pets. Cats, I know that. I have to include cats because I've had some very affectionate cats, much to my horror. Um, I've, had, um, I've had friends who've had long-lived parrots. My chairman at Miami Dade College had a parrot that she had her, she was with 40 years and it passed away. It was 30 when she got it, 70 years old, and she still misses the bird. Loss of a pet. This sounds terrible from a minister, but sometimes I find dogs are much more trustworthy than people. Certainly much nicer than a lot of people. And um, they're also rascals. My two dogs are ancient. They shredded the memo about that. And if you want to keep yourself young, find a rascal that's old and they'll drag you along for a walk to remind you you've got a lot left in you. Dogs have a way of looking at things that crack you up. They don't miss a thing. They really, really don't. They're on top of everything. Loss of a pet. Those of you who've had a pet and lost pets, you still remember pets, all of them. It's isn't amazing. And by name and their personalities. We could go on and on with loss, personal losses, personal ideas, ideals that don't work anymore, a loss of a sense of self. We could go on and on and on. It's, um, it's grief. It's grief, and we need it. I have three ideas about grief before I leave this morning. What is your shelter from the storm? You and I have been given this myth, one of the great worst myths in America, we are rugged individuals. In the far West, we produce rugged individuals. I don't think so. 
How far do you think individuals got alive in the West on their own? Yes, you're riding a horse. You're on your own. A horse throws you, you hit your head, you're knocked out, and you broke a leg. But you're on your own. Good luck with that. We'll find your remains, maybe. You get bitten by a snake. Good luck with that. Oh, here's one for you. You have your own house, your own log cabin. And guess what? There is a massive series of blizzards and you can't get any food. And guess how we find you in springtime? Because you were on your own. I was reading about the average life expectancy in the good old wild west where we produced individuals. 35 was the average life expectancy. Good luck if you're a woman, because guess what they didn't do in childbirth, everybody? Wash their hands. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the father of the famous Supreme Court justice, wrote a piece about we are killing people when we're doing surgery and when we're giving birth with women because our hands are dirty. Here's one for you. Yes, we're rugged individuals. We may be two or three. We come in with all this stuff from the barnyard on our hands and then we work on people. Isn't that lovely? The number one disease for the individuals out in the Wild West was disease, the number one killer. How far are you going to get on your own? There are some who can grieve on their own. There are some who are truly rugged individuals. But the reality is most of us need somebody else. Most of us need a shelter from the storm. And grief raises us a question, what is your shelter from the storm? For, for Dylan, by the way, that song is like Hotel California. How do you even begin to, <laughs> to translate that into sense? I mean, they're like nine, but even, even, nobody even agrees how you translate the Hotel California, neither are shelter from the storm. Crown of Thorns, it's a religious allegory. It's about a divorce. What is your shelter from, where do you go when you grieve? Where do you go? And if you're like me, you're too stubborn. You're just too darn stubborn. And you have to learn to reach out. Let me tell you a side story about how I had to learn some things. I go to get a, um, a major catheterization. It's six hours. And I'm married to Maria for one year. And she says, so what's up today? I said, I have to go for the catheterization. She says, now explain to me that again. I said, well, I get in the car, I go there, and they take all the stuff, and they have to put things in me, and I'm flat on my back, and they have to be sure I don't bleed and everything else. And she says, and then what? And I drive home. She says, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean? She said, you're not doing that by yourself. I said, I didn't want to bother you. She said, what do you think I'm is about? What do you think I'm here for? You think you're going to do that again? I heard about some of the nonsense you pull when you did stuff on your own. You almost fell asleep after coming home from a thing with a chance hospital, almost cracked into a tree and had an accident. When you're in marriage, it's two. It takes a while to learn that for some of us. And when we grieve, what is our shelter from the storm? How do we get over ourselves? Because sometimes ourselves doesn't work. It doesn't help us grieve enough healthy-wise. Number two, gratitude. When we lose somebody, do we ever take time to be grateful for having met them? When we said goodbye to Melissa, I was really surprised, and I mean this gently and kindly, of how many people said, thank you for pointing out what a funeral really is. This took me back. They said, you said, we do two things here today. We grieve, we cry, we're angry, but we're very grateful too. How do you balance these two things? She was, she was, a, she was just, it was Melissa, we had all these things. And people said, you made the service. So one half, we were laughing and we're doing this. And the other half, we, we combined grief and together. And she, I said, gratitude. When we lose somebody, are we grateful for what they did for us? The person you missed. How about those pets? Those rascal pets that saddled up to you when all was lost, places a paw on your leg and looks at you and says, you know, it could be worse. <laughs> they get it. They get it. Where a pet comes up and insists on going out when you're too full of yourself and tries to get you out of the house because they know you need to get out. They don't, you do. The things that are we become grateful for in gratitude. Isn't it strange I turn for my third idea of grief to a Muslim? 
Yeah, to a Muslim. I said to my students when we were dealing with this this week, the first time I read this sentence, I thought this was absolute nonsense. And I said, has this ever happened to you? Any of you here this morning, you read something you think is absolutely stupid. And for reasons that you cannot explain, divine intervention, fate, pick, pick any adjective you want. You go back and revisit what you thought was stupid. And you found it wasn't stupid. You were stupid. Let me read to you this. Sorrow prepares you for joy. What is that? Sorrow prepares you for joy. What does that mean? I thought that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. And Rumi suggests brilliantly that, you know, you and I get too comfortable all the time in doing routines. We have routine ways of thinking, routine ways of coping, right? Do we not? Everybody does. You have routine ways of, you don't even wear routines we have until something doesn't happen. Every morning you get up and you take a hot shower. The one time there's cold water, watch how your whole morning is ruined. Ah, you're used to having hot coffee every morning, some kind of coffee. There is no coffee. The roof blows off the house. You were not paying attention to the, to the, to the tire on your car and suddenly the tire is flat. That, oh, can I go on and on and on? We got routines, routines of coping. Ruby suggests, I thought this was brilliant. Sorrow wipes everything around. It knocks everything out. So you have to revisit all the stuff that you thought was helping you. And it turns out is no longer helping you. Yes, once upon a time, the coping skills you had, the ways you look at things were helpful. But guess what? You've gotten stuck and they're no longer helpful. Listen to this. This is brilliant. It violently sweeps. Sorrow violently sweeps everything out of your house. So new joy can find space to enter. It shakes yellow leaves from the bow of your heart. So fresh green leaves can grow in their place. It pulls up rotten roots so that new roots hidden beneath have room to grow. Whatever sorrow shakes your heart, far better things will take their place. Rumi has this, this poem called, You Are a Guest House. Every being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness, some dark thought, shame, malice. They come knocking at the door. But then he throws in the following. You may be cleaned out for some new delight. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. You have the choice to welcome the guide. You have the choice to welcome a change at looking at yourself and saying, has this sorrow made me look at things all over again? Maybe I need to make some changes. Maybe there is stuff just underneath that needs to come out and I haven't given it a chance and maybe sorrow. Maybe sorrow also has a component of healing and growth. Wow. So I ask you then, as we think of Palm Sunday, let's think of real grief. Real grief, injustice, innocent death, um, kind things blown to smithereens. You can see it right now in our own country again, and in every country again. So we ask ourselves, are we honest about our grief? Do we have shelter from the storm? And we get some gratitude. And maybe sorrow, maybe sorrow can, if we let it, prepare us for unexpected growth, unexpected insight, unexpected and thoroughly, thoroughly surprised joy. Blessings and peace. Amen. Larry is going to lead us today in words, if you would be so kind, Larry.
Larry? Okay, I think we've lost, I think we've lost Larry. Larry, are you there? Okay. I'm there. Okay. The agape meal symbolizes hospitality to me. It welcoming of people to a table. The most hospitable person I ever knew in my life was my late mother-in-law, Lucille Kibler. In her time, there were homeless people that we called hobos and bums that traveled America on freight cars. And when they would come through the small town of Hanoverton, Ohio, and get off of the freight train, someone had scribbled on one of the rails Lucille's address. And they knew just from that address that they could go to that house. And when they got there, she welcomed them. She didn't ask them what they believed or what they thought or how they voted or anything like that. She fed them. She fed them. Today, we gather together and we break bread and we partake of the bread because we need to be fed. And we take a common clay cup and we drink from that cup because it blesses us. And it says to us, you're welcome. You're welcome here. Being hospitable is about saying to someone, come to our table. That's what all souls is about. Anyone come to our table. Bless us so that we're givers and not takers. So that we are hospitable to all who come, no matter what they believe or if they believe. Just welcome us. Amen. Amen. Following our meal, we have words that we say together as welcome. Whether you believe or not believe, if you're here, we welcome you using these very old words. And if Grimmy would pull these up for us, and I think some of you will remember the words right off the bat. Donald? Yes, from Winnie the Pooh. Please repeat after me. Promise me you'll remember. You are braver than you seem, stronger than you seem, smarter than you think. God didn't promise days without pain, laughter without sorrows, sun without rain. But the divine did promise strength for the day comfort for the tears, and light for the way. And Michelle will lead us in a concluding prayer. In your name. So today I offer a short reflection on grief and then an offering of prayer. Grief is never over with. It is not a hard rain or even a raging storm that ends. It never dries up and completely evaporates from our lives. Grief is more like an ocean, wild waves and seemingly unpredictable tides, and it may threaten to drown us entirely unless we let go and ride the waves. As a chaplain and the only bereavement coordinator for the Chicagoland office, I make many calls each week to bereave family members and friends of our patients who died, either recent deaths or sometimes follow-up calls for check-ins months, even a year after. And every one of these calls is an exercise in holding space for the wide ocean of grief that that particular person is navigating. 
providing space for grief is not so much providing shelter from the storm, but getting into the water with the person grieving and helping them see that they can, with time, with the support of community, and with some coping skills, they can navigate their way to the shore. They will not be adrift forever, but they will come ashore a different person than they were before they found themselves in the depths of that ocean. The ocean in this metaphor is a baptismal font writ large. Grieving is a sacred act. It is holy ground and it is a necessary part of being human. No one escapes the reality of death, not even Jesus. There is no life without death. My prayer today for us is that we may honor the grief that we hold and the grief of others, the grief of people in our own personal lives, for ourselves and for those around the world for the sacred and the holy space and the holy process that it is. We have all experienced grief and loss and will continue to do so as long as we are alive. Let our grief be a teacher for us, a force that reminds us that we are united with every living thing on this earth and beyond. Let us hold our grief and each other's with grace, compassion, patience, and above all things with deep and abiding love. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. And now may the road rise to meet you May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall gently upon your fields. And when we meet again, may the divine in me greet and embrace the divine in you. Amen. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for everybody for being here this morning. Chet, my seminary classmate, Mary Grimmy from that small village called Tampa, John and Christine from up in Port Orange, Pat Sullivan from Forest Hills, Pam G from Forest Hills, Michelle and Mark from a quaint village far west of Chicago, Maureen down in farm farm country, Rick and Judy here, um, Gail and Tom from Port Orange, Cecilia from down the street. Chris Diaz from North Miami, Bobby Vance from Kissimmee, Barbara Young from, from around the corner in South Miami, Cindy and Larry Deesh. Thank you very much, Larry, for the words. They were so right on. Thank you from, from, from uh, Port Orange as well. Um, Alan and his boyfriend have been taking care of Chet and deeply grateful for that. Danny Sorkin from, uh, from Forest Hills, Amelia Schweitzer, 10 miles west of Merritt Island, Hal and Linda from Port Orange, Patricia Kincare, our first treasurer here from down the road, Serge Cruz from Sedona, and Felix Becerra uh, from Miami as well. We have services next, next, uh, next Sunday Easter. Theme is Little Resurrections. Little ones, yours and mine. We'll see you then, and then Michelle is on after that. I'll be assisting her the other way around. Bless you all. We're here if you need and us. And don't forget book club on Saturday. Book club on Saturday mornings as well. Bless you all. Bless you all. Have a joyous and blessed day. May it be grand. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you all. Thank Bless you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.